Hello, my name is Ariane Zorchis. I'm going to be reading from my essay, Cities of Broken Teeth, Cities of Dust and Blood. And I'm going to start about half or two thirds of the way through the essay. In 2016, Palestinian artist and filmmaker Khaled Jarrar journeyed along the U.S.-Mexico border, observing similarities between the border wall there and the wall between Israel and Palestine. He created an installation which locals are calling Khaled's Ladder. Taking metal from the border wall, he constructed a ladder and planted it upright in open space near the wall in Tijuana. This was his first trip to the U.S. after being prevented by Israeli soldiers from leaving the West Bank to attend an exhibition featuring his work at the New Museum in New York, despite having obtained a visa. I saw Gerard speak at the University of Arizona, where I'd gone to graduate school and taught English for years. We sat in a cool, air-conditioned conference room with floor-to-ceiling glass walls. He was presenting, together with Jewish artist Robert Yerachmiel Snyderman, on art and images of the occupation. Gaza has been a laboratory for weapons testing for both the Israel and the U.S., Gerard said in his presentation. Some of the weapons tested on Gazans were developed right here at the University of Arizona, which has extensive defense and homeland security research programs. Gerard showed us an excerpt of an old video from the late 80s or early 90s about the settlement of Israel. Israeli strategy towards Palestinians became known as break the bone strategy, the video narrator said in a soothing voice. The break the bone strategy I find when I look it up later is a literal term. During the first intifada, which started in 1987, Yitzhak Rabin directly ordered soldiers to break the bones of Palestinian protesters. Though Rabin eventually shifted from military suppression to attempts at a diplomatic solution, he was assassinated before the two-state solution could be finalized in the Oslo Accords. The right-wing government that took power after his death shifted course back to military suppression, back to ongoing Israeli incursion into and settlement of the West Bank. A recent State Department map shows Palestinian populations in the occupied West Bank in white, against a green Israeli background, and I am shocked to see the degree to which the once contiguous territory has been moth-eaten, broken up by illegal Israeli settlements. The Palestinian populations now are a scattering of broken teeth. Gerard says, as Palestinians, we cannot know our landscape. We are separated. The occupation prevents us from knowing one another. We are alien in our own land. Our imaginations are proscribed, imprisoned. A close friend, an American writer who just returned from a research trip in Egypt, Jordan, Israel, and the West Bank, described her time in Egypt and Jordan as beautiful, joyful, expansive. In contrast, she said, in Israel, everything felt so heavy, predetermined, walls and barbed wire fence everywhere. She took the buses that mostly Palestinians and Israeli Arabs use, and they were constantly being stopped at checkpoints, forced out into the broiling sun, into caged-in areas, while the bus was searched by 20-year-old Israeli soldiers with machine guns. At one point, she thought, if we have to stand here any longer in this cage in the hot sun, I'm going to lose it, lose my shit entirely. And if I feel this way, after a week or two weeks or three of this treatment, how do people here stand it? Even the old, old women were angry, furious. You could see it in their faces. And if you're making even the old women hate you, her voice trailed off. Israel has become distorted, built itself into a cage by caging in the people it has displaced. James Baldwin described racism in the U.S. in similar terms. No one has pointed out yet with any force that if I am not a man here, you are not a man here. You cannot lynch me and keep me in ghettos without becoming something monstrous yourselves. In early 2019, Michael Rakowitz, an American artist of Jewish Iraqi heritage, withdrew from the 2019 Whitney Biennial. 
He withdrew after it became known that Warren Canders, the vice chair of the Whitney's board, was the owner of Safari Land, a manufacturer whose tear gas and other munitions have been employed against asylum seekers at the U.S.-Mexico border, against protesters everywhere from Standing Rock, Ferguson, Oakland, Puerto Rico, and Egypt, and against journalists and civilians in Gaza and the West Bank. For me, this was a material evidence of the way in which there's a not-so-invisible line that connects the museum here in New York to spaces like the Border Wall and Palestine and Istanbul and Kurdistan and everywhere, Rakowitz explains. When I was at MIT a few years ago, there was a scientist who told me that in science, when you want to know how a system works, you introduce a coloring agent. And so the gas was this incredible agent that made very visible and very, very clear the way in which the power structures had been drawn. In the end, Rakowitz said, I remembered the tear gas canisters that I saw at Dar Jassir, at Emily Jassir and Anne-Marie Jassir's artist residency in Bethlehem. This beautiful house that their ancestor, ancestor built is right there at the border wall, and it's where demonstrations are held against the Israeli army, and it's where those tear gas canisters end up in the garden. So instead of picking flowers, they're gathering the tear gas canisters. And these things for me are a very physical and visual symbol of bodies that are being evacuated from the world, either through death or through displacement. When asked why he does work in Palestine, Rakowitz responds, to say that art doesn't have a place in these cities under siege is a further dehumanization of the people that live there and a spectacularization of this violent image that we have of such places. In 2015, Anna and I went to see a performance by Mohaled Rassem, who was born and trained in Baghdad and now directs in Antwerp. During the war that resulted from the U.S. invasion of Iraq, he fled to Belgium as a refugee, waiting five years to receive his papers. We went to see Body Revolution at the theater on Het Breithof in Maastricht, climbing many sets of increasingly narrow stairs to the smallest dance theater on the top floor. In Body Revolution, three men, three men dance silently in front of a screen projecting images of destroyed buildings. Body Revolution is about violence and what violence does to a person. How violence develops into fear and fear stays in the body, Rassam said in 2015. As the lights go down, the audience tapers into silence. White sheets hang behind the dance space. A projection on them slowly pans to a scene of wrecked buildings, gray and black and abandoned. Instantly, I am carried back to Darwish's lyric, Memory for Forgetfulness, where he describes the vacuum bomb dropped on Beirut by Israel. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for watching and listening. <laughs>